I also have to confess that it's a, it's a real honor to be here. I understand this is the charter chapter of Veterans for Peace, um, where it all started. And Veterans for Peace is one of the, uh, the organizations that I do the most work with. When I was in Iraq, I was an infantry squad leader. So whenever something happened, it wasn't like we sat on the, on the sidelines. We had to be there, we had to go there. I think that when, when it comes to PTSD, this is, this is the kind of experience that, that we traditionally would look, would look at. Uh, going on a mission when you're either walking or in the back of a truck and then a bomb goes off and you see somebody get killed. This is the kind of thing that when you come home plays a big role in your behavior and how you, you view the world. It's like, I, I like to refer to this as, as, as a kind of contract that was violated. It's a contract that we have with the outside world. And that contract says that when you go outside, bombs don't go off. It says that, you know, if you just live a normal life and, you know, under normal conditions, you go out and children don't throw grenades at you. So you go into a place and even though you're not in any danger, you sit with your back to the wall because perhaps subconsciously your mind is thinking that somebody's gonna go in with a machine gun. And that's the experience that I understood to be post-traumatic stress disorder. And so I went to the VA in Miami and I got my treatment for PTSD. I was able to start working and improving uh, my PTSD, my isolation, my fear, my anxiety. But there were things that were not being covered by this treatment because they had nothing to do with a thought process. First of all, because there are things that happen that don't really include any thought processing, you know, startle responses and things like that, the treatment does not really go into. Um, but also because I believe, and this is a concept that's beginning to be discussed in the VA and with other clinicians, um, that there is something outside of that contract that we have with the outside world, which is violated when we're in a war situation, when we go out there and things that are not supposed to happen, happen to us, and that triggers a fear response. But there is a contract that we have with ourselves. When we are born and we are raised in a society by our parents and by our neighbors and in our school and by our teachers, we learn that we're not supposed to go out there and kill people. And this is something that the military understood very well when they realized that during World War I and II, um, the, um, the, the percentage of soldiers who actually fired upon their enemies was about 15%, 15 to 20%. There were instances in which soldiers would stare at their enemy with their weapons and choose not to fire upon each other because there is not inherent in human nature to to, to kill our own. We, we don't go out there and it's, it's not an easy thing to stare into a human being's face and squeeze the trigger. So what they did is they changed the training to remove the thought process. They changed the training to remove the emotion from the act of killing. And so when you go to basic training these days and you learn to shoot, um, they basically have this, this range where they have the, um, uh, a human silhouette pop up and they give you just a second or two to fire at that, at that um, silhouette and before it goes down, a new one is coming up. They emphasize heavily on the, the, the mechanical process of doing this. So you work on things like um, uh, mastering your, your sight skills, Ma you know, learning to put the silhouette in, in what we call center mass, you know, through the, the side of the, the rifle, working on your breathing, uh, working on your, your trigger squeeze. They tell you you have to be surprised when, when, when you finally squeeze the trigger. And they turn it into a mechanical thing. And so when you go to war and you're in a combat situation and you're being fired upon, you don't really think about the person who's on the other side. You don't really think that this may be a taxi driver or a college professor or whatever, you know, whoever person, you know, you don't really think of this person as a human being. You just think, that you're being fired upon and that you're going to fire back. It's a mechanical process. But what happens when you're removed from that environment, you don't really learn, they don't teach you a way to turn off that mechanical 
response, that automatic response does not get shut off. And you don't go back into being human and learning how to deal with the emotions that were removed from that mechanical act of killing. And then you have to face the reality uh, when you're outside of the battlefield and having a startled response and being nervous and um, trying to carry out, you know, carry on with your life. It's not easy because you, you, you know, you just don't have the training. You, don't, you just don't have the ability to go back to being a human being and readjusting to your life uh, that you left behind when you, when you went to war. And I think that when you violate the contract that you have with yourself, something happens um, that, you know, the, the term is, is the, the new term that they have is moral injury. And I want to read what this is. Moral injury occurs when a person does things that transgress deeply held beliefs, witness that in others, or witness intense human suffering and cruelty. And I remember seeing the, 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 the crowd get together and get quiet and move as one to one area. And then I remember seeing a young man emerge from the crowd. And he must have been 16 years old. He was a teenager, very, very young. And he emerged from the crowd. He separated himself from the crowd and started walking towards the building. And he had a grenade. And I remember seeing this young man move and breathe and walk and swing his arm through the uh, rear aperture of my, my rifle sight. And I remember him moments later on the ground, dead, you know, laying on a pool of blood. And two men coming from the same crowd with their hands up, uh, their arms raised, you know, and, and as a sign that they were unarmed, and grabbing this young man by his shoulders and pulling him through his own blood away from the crowd and, and, I mean, away from where he fell and back into the crowd. I don't remember the moment when I opened fire on this young man. I know that I opened fire on him because I stopped shooting after we killed him. And I remember that before we went on to the next mission, I went into a dark room and I pulled my magazine from my rifle and I counted the bullets and I knew that I had fired 11 bullets at him. My mind erased the moment when he went down. My mind erased the moment when I shot him and killed him. I didn't kill him by myself. I, you know, we were all shooting at him, and I have the benefit of collective guilt, but yet I, sh I shot him. And this is what I'm talking about when I, when I say that there is a violation of the contract that we have with ourselves. I know that this young man, um, had a grenade. I know that he was hostile. I know that we had been, been we, we, we were given the order to open fire on anybody who threw a grenade. I know that this is someone capable of throwing a grenade at American soldiers who is capable of injuring and killing people in the future. And when it comes to a justification for killing somebody in war, this is a justified kill. And yet in my mind and in my heart, there was something telling me, you know, this young man is too far. He can't do anything to you. And then there is the more basic human things, you know. It's a human being. It's, you know, it's a very, very young man, full of life, breathing, moving, walking, who has a family. And I know that there was something inside of me that was telling me, don't shoot. Do not open fire on this young man. And yet I did. I squeezed the trigger and he was killed. And this is just one instance. And we have, right now we have upwards of two million young men and women who have served in Iraq and Afghanistan who have been gone, you know, who have had experiences like this, you know, on a daily basis for already well, how many years? Since, since 2001. So when you, when you deal with this type of situation, you're not really dealing with the fear of being killed by a bomb on the road. You're not responding to a fear of going out there and being shot or being killed by a grenade thrown by a child. You're not dealing with the fear of the environment and how the environment's going to turn against you. This is a different type of injury. This is an injury that you inflicted upon yourself. This is the result of a violation of that internal contract that says you should not kill another human being. 
And I don't think that we understand this when, when we talk about PTSD treatment. What are some of the uh, events that took place in Iraq that bother you the most? And I t shared this incident with him, and he told me basically what any psychologist would say, you're being too hard on yourself, you know, this was a justified kill, you were in a war situation, you were in a combat situation, he threw a grenade, the, gr the grenade exploded, you were given the order, he would have killed people someplace else. And I think that this has a lot to do with this thing that we call unconditional positive regard, you know, which is, I think it comes from the humanist school of psychologists, which is that, you know, you approach someone who has been through a war experience and has killed people, or a rapist, or a, a serial killer, or anybody who's been through a very traumatizing experience, who has done something really bad, and you don't judge them, you don't judge the person, because if you start judging the person, then you're not going to be able to provide the care that that person needs, you're not going to be able to help that person uh, overcome uh, whatever situation that person is going through. However, I think that for, in order for us to be able to deal with this moral injury, we have to make an acknowledgement that something horrible happened. We can mistake this unconditional positive regard with telling somebody, you know, what you did is great and you're a hero, welcome home, you're a patriot, whatever. It doesn't help. I think that much like, uh, you know, a, an alcoholic has to recognize that he or she is an alcoholic in order to begin the process of healing and recovering uh, from alcoholism, people who go to war and commit you know, crimes or, you know, violate their internal contracts have to make an acknowledgement that they violated their moral course. And without making this acknowledgement, we're not going anywhere. Going to see a psychologist or going to see a, a, a therapist or going into a, a, a group session in order to heal ourselves is going to help us heal ourselves when we're trying to deal with an injury that occurred when we injured other people and when we violated our own moral core. I think this requires us to transcend uh, our own self-interest. I think this requires us to, to, to co commit acts of restoration. I think that when we go to see a psychologist because we want to overcome a fear or we want to overcome a trauma, we're thinking about our own benefit. We're thinking about, we're asking ourselves the question, what can we do in order to go out there and go back to school? and graduate and get a PhD? What can we do to go out there and have a better relationship with our children or our wives and husbands? What can we do to go out there and live more within the, the parameters of a traditional life and you know, meet someone, get married, have children, um, have a, a, a profession, retire, you know, do all these things? No, the question is what we have what is the origin of this injury? How did it happen? It didn't happen because somebody committed, you know, uh, uh, an act of violence against us, but because we committed an act of violence against someone else who didn't deserve it, and in doing so, we injured our souls. And so, in order for us to heal that, we need to step outside of our own interests and go out there and restore the balance. And we need to go out there and help people and we need to go out there and do acts of atonement. We have a long way to go when it comes to understanding moral injury um, and learning to deal with it, accepting the fact that we were out there and we committed these acts that injured our souls because we violated this moral principle that we lived by, and now we have to step outside of our own interests to go out there and restore the balance. And I think that um, that's, that's where I stand on, on PTSD and, and, and moral injury. Uh, there is um, a group called the, uh, the, the Truth Commission on Conscience and War, and they're doing a lot of work around that. They've just created a thing called the Soul, the Soul Repair Project. Um, I don't have the information right now about it, but this is one of their, their main uh, concerns, is to, uh, to understand moral injury and treat it and create awareness about it. So I encourage you to, to find out more. Um, it's called the, the Soul Repair Project. And that, that's it, uh, that concludes my remarks.